I try just to give you a little bit of an idea uh, about this big world of direct democracy. Uh, I'm, I'm locally active, I'm active on these European issues, but I'm also, as a journalist, having the privilege to, to go everywhere and to say, hello, I'm coming, uh, I want to talk to you. And that's a nice thing because that, happened, that brings me to many places and I can, in a way, combine my just curiosity as a journalist with my activity as a Democrat. And uh, uh, I want just to tell you about three small things. Uh, one uh, thing is when I, uh, a year ago, uh, traveled to Minsk, Belarus. It's a nice country in the middle of Europe, not far from the center. And I uh, came there, was, uh, uh, I was received by the director of the Belarus National Broadcasting Company. Why? Because I'm the correspondent for Northern Europe for the Swiss National Broadcasting Company. He welcomed me with a, with a dinner and, uh, uh, and he said in his speech, Belarus and Switzerland are the same. <laughs> and, uh, I, I said, that's very nice. Why? And he said, our constitutions are providing the same direct democratic rights. And, uh, I was very impressed and uh, I said, that's very nice. Let's discuss about the practice. And uh, then he said, let's take a vodka. <laughs> from Minsk to, to the EU, to Vilnius, at the border uh, in the night, 2 o'clock in the morning, they said to me, uh, yeah, come out, come out of the train, and they arrested me. And uh, I asked, why? And they said, in your visa, it's written that you pass the border by uh, 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 30 minutes ahead of this time. And now you are 30 minutes late, so your visa is not valid anymore. And I had to stay at the border uh, for about 15 hours in a nice place with uh, people who were really in a hard shape. People who were coming from Afghanistan, people who came from other places who were there for weeks. So that was a very interesting thing as a journalist and a very hard sign that you shouldn't ask about direct democracy in Belarus. Another experience was when I was in Greenland uh, about two years ago ahead of the referendum on, on independence they had, or self-control, uh, self-autonomy, uh, I was uh, meeting the, head, the election head of the Greenlandic National uh, Autonomous Government, and he explained to me how they are dealing with elections or referendums in Greenland. And uh, he showed me all the constituencies in Greenland. Some were very far in the north, some in the south, and there was very one special constituency called the uh, Sirius Patrol. I ask, what's that? There are seven people who are uh, in the electorate of this, of this, of this uh, uh, constituency. And he said, this is the, 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 the hunt sledge patrol going on the inland ice which is always on the way. They are controlling what's in the, in the, in the, in the part. And I asked, how do, do they vote? And he said, that's a very big thing for us to organize. They have to send the ballots for these people by airplane to Denmark. And from Denmark, a military airplane goes over the inland ice and parachutes the votes to this, uh, to this patrol because they see where they are. And then the, the head of the patrol is also the electoral officer of this uh, constituency and he has a fax machine with a satellite. So the people can vote and then he are faxing in the votes into the central electoral body in Nuuk. And that was for me the, really the sign how important it is to have a free and fair election and referendum. Every vote, vote counts. <laughs> and the third story is the most dynamic. It's the one which I started to experience two years ago in Reykjavik, in Iceland, where at one day uh, the Swiss radio called me and said, tomorrow you will be in Reykjavik. And I said, why? Because in Reykjavik the future will start. Because in Reykjavik the whole global crisis will get an uh, image, a sign. You will be able to explain to the world what's going on. And I went to Reykjavik the day after, and really the people were out on the streets, the banks were totally crashed down, which were ten times the national income at some point, 
and the government was totally in, in, in turmoil and the next two, three months people were on the street to say this government has to go, the government in the end had to go, the revolution won, a new government came in, but the people were not happy enough about that. They wanted to change the whole game, they wanted to change the whole democracy, so they asked for a total reset of the Icelandic constitution, the Icelandic democracy. What did they do? They did five national assemblies where people from all over the country gathered to make an agenda for a new democracy in Iceland. And they, they did that, and then they voted, elected a constitutional parliament with 25 people, not in parliament, not in parties, independent citizens, and these 25 people they started to work this spring to make a new constitution until the end of July. They have to propose a new constitution and one of the key aspects of it is direct democracy. And my bad luck was I was too many times in Iceland and also explained them about direct democracy. So nowadays it's not a surprise when 3 o'clock in the morning somebody from this constitutional convention calls me and says, what was it exactly with this initiative? <laughs> so uh, I'm very much involved in this work now as well and I think what are the lessons of that is that when you see Belarus you shouldn't see what's on the, in the constitution alone or in the law, that's the truth. When you see what's going on in Greenland, then you really see that every vote has to count. And in Iceland you can learn that we have sometimes to really try to reset, to do something new, to go ahead and to be courageous that we can do something new. Thank you very much. That was